Let's get started here. Today is July 15th, and all three commissioners are present. Looks like we've got some public comments, uh, just a few folks. So why don't we get started with Mr. Dan Pike. Hello, sir. Good afternoon. Um, I just wanted to come up and say thank you. Um, I like the process and, and the result with uh, the RFP that got Harcourt on board. And uh, I want to speak specifically to Harcourt and Toll House's proposal for the granary and say it's my understanding that both of those proponents are ready to move forward. That in talking with some of the folks involved with that, they think that it is a very sound business opportunity for them. And so, which by extension is you guys, because if they're building something, you guys are getting paid for it, which also means all of us as taxpayers uh, recognize that benefit as well. But the other benefit is that it's a, it's a structure that the community has long indicated they would like to see preserved. So I think there's all kinds of wins for moving forward quicker rather than slower. And so I'd just like to, again, thank you for, for your work to date on that and encourage you to move forward more quickly. Um, if possible. Thank you. Thank in you, regards Dan. to what you're saying, Dan, I think back, I don't know how long ago it's been, maybe Rob can give me a number, that we had consultants look at that building and say that it's you know, not really repairable. So I sure hope that it works out be the other way. That would be nice. But so My understanding is our court building comes from both sides. <laughs> All right, thanks, Dan. And um, Kat? And Kat, you know, I've never known how to pronounce your last name, so C. thank you. Yeah, no, no offense taken. Um, good afternoon, my name's Kat C. I live and work in Bellingham, and I'm a co-founder of the Save the Granary Group. Um, just to speak to what you mentioned, Jim, it has been shown through a variety of documentation of other architects, engineers, other folks that have gone through that building that that structure is incredibly sound, and it shows from the three proposals that were submitted that there is significant interest in that building and we're excited that Toll House was chosen to move forward on that. Um, I would like to thank the port as well for seeking out and working with Harcourt and Toll House to make the Granary Building renovation a reality. Today I spoke with architect John Reed who's working with Harcourt on this project and John tells me that Harcourt is willing and eager to move forward with the Granary project as a launch pad for further waterfront development. When I spoke yesterday with architect Mike Smith, who's working with Toll House, he was also enthusiastic about moving forward with the Granary Building. All the pieces are there, and we're thankful that the port has worked hard to get to this point. I encourage you to complete the master development agreement with Harcourt and start work on this building. Thanks, Kat. Uh, Lynette Felber. Good afternoon. Um, I'm a local historic preservation consultant and a member of the city's historic preservation commission, but I'm here today as an ordinary citizen to urge the port to move forward with the rehabilitation of the granary as an exciting gateway to the redevelopment of the entire uh, waterfront district. Um, I came before this body in 2012 and presented a slideshow on the history of the granary and it was something that you used uh, to help the um, people uh, present their proposals and have access to historic pictures. Since there's a new commission, I thought I'd just say a few words about the history of the granary. I think it's important to know the history of any resource before it is either rehabilitated or demolished, because in that way we can gauge its importance to the community. This building was originally the distribution center for the Washington Cooperative Egg and Poultry Association. It was a statewide movement of farmers to market their goods collectively. They marketed their poultry and eggs internationally, but also locally. They had contracts with the Pacific American Fisheries. They had contracts with the Leopold Hotel. And as I've gone through the community and talked to neighborhood associations and political groups about the history of the building. I've met residents who worked in the granary, who candled eggs or who drove trucks out to the country to deliver, deliver the grain to uh, farms. And this building is important to them. 
This building is important to young people who've created a Facebook page to save the granary, to preserve it for future generations. This building is important to the invisible anonymous person who trims that ivy heart on it and has been doing that for years. Um, I think that this could be an exciting catalyst for future development and to rehabilitate the granary would be in the spirit of cooperation that motivated the people who built it in 1929. Thanks, Lynette. I want to make a comment to that also, if I may. A friend of mine is my age, which I won't tell you what that is, but he and his dad used to take eggs from Ferndale by wagon down to Greenery. So that's interesting history, too. I gotta look at old Jim. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Michael Lilliquist. Well, unfortunately, I'm not sure what I can add to this conversation. I'm here also to support the Grain Reed. Many people have already said things. I'm especially pleased to hear about Mr. Reed and Tollhouse's point of view on the Grain Reed. Um, let me see what I can add to this. Um, the city of Bellingham just completed our uh, one phase of our downtown planning. And we've also done some rezoning areas like Fairhaven. And one of the things that, I'm not in the business of redevelopment, and probably neither, not, most of you are not either. So here's what I've learned. Preserving the historic character of an area is of enormous value. It creates a sense of place that brings investment, that brings psychological commitment, that makes people stay and invest and grow and live in the community. Preserving something like the grain and all the rest of the vestiges we have in Bellingham is of enormous economic potential. And for someone like myself, who has some responsibility for setting the right kind of background or template in terms of land use, what we do in our document to the city is make sure we don't bulldoze saveable buildings because we know that their value is sometimes nearly priceless in terms of what sort of other developments and activities that they can create. Pike Place Market is a perfect example. You know what, it's not that special in terms of just you know, pieces of metal and wood and iron, but the sense of history that it creates, the anchor that it creates, the economic vitality it creates, you can't go anywhere online and look up Seattle and tourism and not see the Pike Place Market. You can't go anywhere and look up Bellingham and not see Fairhaven and its historic buildings. You can't go anywhere like in Whatcom County and not see pictures of the old city hall that's been preserved. The Green Rebuilding is that kind of a calling card. So yes, Toll House or whoever else can develop that and they can turn a profit off of that building, but the community will turn a profit off that building. So please, as quick as you can, get out of the way of the private sector and let them do the work. <laughs> Thank <you>. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> So th that's everybody who signed up. Uh, anybody else want to make a comment during this time? Anybody? Anybody? Come on up. Hi, my name is uh, Dennis Mead. I'm a co-owner of uh, Scratch and Peck Feeds. And uh, we have a kind of a vested interest in supporting that the granary be, uh, be saved because of the nature of our business. We're all about chickens. And that was the history. And we're making history now. So um, we would only hope that, that the continuum would be respected. And uh, so I'd like to see the granary proceed. And that's all. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Okay, so we'll close our public comment period. Thanks for the bell, Diane. Mm -hmm. And let's just move to our consent agenda. A motion to approve consent agenda items A through G. All right, any discussion real quick on that one, gentlemen? Well, you're looking for that, Jim. I might make a comment um, on uh, D, the high-tech roof uh, roofing company. As I looked at the uh, the bids on that, boy, those are really close. Uh, Two hundred eighty thousand nine hundred dollars to two hundred seventy-nine thousand four hundred seventy-two dollars. Um, boy, there's one happy guy that came in just right, and the other. <laughs> really disappointed. I guess my question then is probably to Fred. Um, I'm surprised there weren't more people bidding. Is that just because it's the middle of the summer and roofers are busy? You know, I think that's, that's the case, uh, Commissioner. And also, this is a fairly large job for most roofing companies, you know, with prevailing wage and over-the-water insurance is, re is required on, in, on parts of the work. So um, typically we get 
uh, uh, just a few bidders on this type of work. So I think it's, uh, and these are generally the two, Axiom uh, High Tech, who was the low bidder in this case, and uh, there's usually someone from Skagit County that comes up, but not in this case. Yeah, roughly a thousand dollars on a two hundred and eighty thousand dollar project. Close bids, pretty mm -hmm. close. Yes, that's my only comment. That was my comment. Was the same. I was looking for my sheet. Uh, mine uh, continues on to the back page. I didn't quite understand the uh, alternate being twenty one versus ninety four. Can you explain that? Uh, I think you're talking about another job, Commissioner. There, I think you're talking about the passenger ramp. Yeah, that's a different which is, one, I think, Jim. Which is a counterweight for the um, that that needs to be repaired, and I oh, think. Oh yes, 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 yes. Yeah, and I think the answer there is uh, simply that the contractor looked at it in a, a far different way, and in a way that uh, was not right. The, the right solution that was spec'd out. So he, he lost out in that Thank case. Thank you. As a matter of fact, they were sitting in this room here and mentioned that very thing that they didn't weren't sure how to how to bid that, so they put in that large amount. And of course, it it didn't cost them the job, but uh, it, it may have because it was an alternate, and uh, we didn't we did select it, but they weren't the, they were high, of course. Okay, thanks. That's it. Yep. That's it. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And let's move on to. Do we want to do this real estate first or let's presentations first? Yeah, uh, we moved the real estate in because we thought we were going to have a guest. The guest is not okay. here, so you're free to do the presentations first. Yeah, how about we do our presentations first in that case? So, Tamara, it looks like Tamara's up. Good afternoon, Commissioners. We've got the financial results for the first half of the year. Uh, it'll be our standard fare plus a couple other items um, for related to budget for our budget retreat on Thursday. So just a couple little comments I'll make about that as we go along. <coughs> Starting with the balance sheet, this is what we always like to look at, make sure that we're paying down our debt as, as scheduled and then make sure that our net assets, that green triangle, continues to move up, and if it doesn't, we know why, but in this case, it, it has moved up in the past six months. And this is our six quarter net asset trend. Uh, we wanna make sure it is an upward trend. The dips are the annual uh, environmental liability adjustments. And in December of 2013, that was almost a $4 million adjustment. But the net assets continue to move upward, so, so we're okay. Debt to asset ratio is an important is an important item to keep an eye on. Um, it's a measure of the degree that the port's assets are funded by debt. Average is about 50%, so we like to stay under that, and we have stayed under that uh, for many years, and we're at 43% now. The debt service coverage is how easily the port is able to make its annual debt payments. It's kind of a function of cash flow to your debt payments. And this is going to be important to keep an eye on during the budget process. We want to make sure that we have enough cash flow every single year to keep our, um, to keep our ratio within that 1.25 legal requirement. And um, at the end of 2013, and again, the first half of 2014, we were at 2.2, 2.3. This is what our current investments look like. We have about a little over $13 million invested in something a little longer term than um, a year or so. The average interest rate on these investments is just over 1.3%, just a function of the market. The balance of our invested cash is in the local government investment pool, um, just over 31.5 million. 
we're going to start transferring some of that LGIP money into, into uh, longer term investments pretty soon just to get a little bit better interest rate and help our cash flow. What would longer term investments be? Well, we don't invest any longer than five years. Um, normally between two and five, maybe with some callable features. Um, yeah, we'll just see maybe an extra interest point or so. It's all federal agencies like what you're seeing. Okay. Yeah, real safe investments. So moving into budget mode, the projected year-end cash, um, we looked at items that we thought would change from the budget. So our operations, we historically perform better than budget. And I looked back the past few years, and it's usually between a half million to a million and a half dollars better than budget. So I figured a million dollars, uh, looking at the, at the trend, that's where I think we'll end up. Capital savings, the $2 million, um, it looks like when it's all said and done, the commercial terminal is going to come in about $2 million under budget. So that'll be additional cash that we hadn't budgeted for. And then the passenger facility charges, this is a function of the emplanements at the airport. We get a little over $4 per emplaned passenger, and since the emplanements are down, we're estimating that our uh, PFCs are going to be shy of what we budgeted. So at the end of the day, end of the year, we're thinking we'll have almost $3 million more than what we budgeted this year. Moving into revenues and expenses, um, year to date, we've brought in about $17.5 million in revenues. 12.7 um, of that is from operating, um, all our operating divisions. A little over $4 million is from grants, taxes, interest income on those investments, and just about 600000 for uh, public priorities like um, meetings and events or uh, the tissue warehouse rental. Expenses have come in just over $10 million so far this year, uh, 6.7 from operations again, and then about $2 million uh, for environmental cleanups, interest expense on our current debt, and then about 1.4 for public, public priority. So moving into the divisions, Sorry. Oh. Uh, aviation, financial highlights. Uh, the first half of the year, uh, total revenue is a little bit lower than budget, but um, pretty close. Expenses are higher than last year, but within budget, that's basically because of the the terminal expand or the expanded terminal. And the expenses are high. Oh, sorry. Uh, marinas. Marinas are performing just right at budget for revenues. Uh, expenses are are lower than budget, and this is really due to that insurance deductible that we were reimbursed for. So we expensed it in 2013 and then we recovered it in 2014. So that's why you have the dip in the expense. Marine terminals, again, revenues look a little bit better than budget. And this is why I, th I thought at year end we'd be better than budget for cash flow. Um, marine terminals, their expenses are lower than budget, but I expect to see that come up as our maintenance and repairs. Uh, happen over the course of the year. So I think we'll be closer than it looks. Real estate, revenues are a little bit higher again. Uh, this should even out by the end of the year. Some of our customers pay an annual concession fee and so we're seeing that at the beginning of each year. Total expenses are a little bit lower than budget, um, but again, I think that'll move up closer to budget as more maintenance and repairs and groundskeeping um, happens throughout the summer and fall months. So moving on to capital spending, the first uh, six months of the year, we've spent about $5 million of a $20 million budget. Uh, aviation, we've spent about $1.8 million um, just to complete the commercial terminal expansion. Marine services, we've spent over $2 million on Inner Harbor floats, the shipping terminal, main pier repairs, and miscellaneous maintenance projects. Real estate, uh, we've started FMIP projects, fender piles, and again, miscellaneous um, other items. We've 
repaired uh, uh, the Blaine end pier, boat launch rinse downs, and then other uh, repairs of public uh, areas. So remaining capital spending for the year, we have about $15 million left um, in our budget. Aviation, so there's $8 million left to spend, but we think that about $2 million of that is going to be a saving, so it'll drop it down to $6 million. And then about $3.5 million we're going to postpone to next year. Um, that'll be the general aviation rehab and the noise study. So that will be spent, just not by the end of this year. And then marine services, real estate, and other operating <coughs> divisions, we do expect to spend the remaining of the budget. We've, all those projects are underway. So do you have any questions about the financial part of the presentation so far? Mm -hmm. Good. OK, great. So moving on to risk management activities, there were no major incidents in 2014 so far. I'd like to keep it that way. Open claims for the port. The February boat fire was closed in April, so that'll that'll come off our list. We just have the two other, the GE boat, boat fire and the AMHS passenger ramp ongoing. And there's no, I don't have any new information on those two. And there are also open claims against the port, those two. And again, those are, they have legal actions pending and I don't have additional information on that. Commissioner what, What's asked, the legal oh. action that's pending on that? On which one? <laughs> on the risk management activities. Mm -hmm. the, the so the uh, passenger ramp, um, mm -hmm. there was an injured Alaska Marine Highway System employee and she initiated a personal injury claim against the port. And then the GE boat fire, the Lange and Taylor estates have uh, filed suit against the port as well. So those are the, the actions pending. Commission has also asked that we report quarterly on the stormwater program. Samples were taken, results under permit benchmark, and all training and record keeping are in compliance. And then finally, our safety reports. This, uh, we've had four recordable injuries for the first half of the year. This is quite a bit higher than in previous years, uh, bringing the recordable incident rate up to 4.29 and lost workday rate at 1.07. Uh, the safety committee took a look at this and has been working on revamping the new employee safety orientation. Um, these were maintenance and uh, groundskeeping crew that, that were hurt on the job. It had some impact on our insurance rates. It will, For yeah. sure. Yeah. <clears throat> Tamara, what, what would be a recordable injury? Something, like, give me something really minor, though. Uh, something minor would be somebody was pruning blackberries and a bush came and scratched them in the eye. All right. So maybe they had to seek medical treatment, but may or may not have had a lost work day. Cut but finger, thing like that? Uh, I think if you, maybe Elizabeth. Yeah, Elizabeth. So, uh, OSHA <laughs> defines recordable injuries as anything that requires medical attention in excess of re regular first aid. It also okay. defines it as anything that requires any type of job restriction uh, or uh, ongoing care and treatment. So, like physical therapy, mm -hmm. you have to go back and have physical therapy or prescription medicine. So, in the example that we had uh, someone trimming blackberries. Mm -hmm. Okay. Stitches, butterfly bandage in lieu of stitches, broken bones, those are all recordable injuries. She's a doctor. I usually just grab some duct tape, but I, you know. I, uh, duct tape in lieu of stitches, I don't know. It works. Duct tape in lieu of stitches. All four uh, injuries you say were in the maintenance yes. department? Thank you. That's it. That's it. Any, any questions? Any questions? No. Nope. Nope. All right. Easy squeezy. Thanks again, Tamara. Thank you. And now a quick update from Rob. I'm just guessing it's going to be Rob because he's hovering behind you, Tamara.
personally look at it. It's pretty good. Commissioners, um, give you a, a little bit of an update here on where we're at with Harcourt. Everyone hear me okay? Yes. So uh, back in March, or actually end of February, you gave me permission to enter into a 120-day exclusive negotiating period with Harcourt. That 120 days, we executed the agreement on, I believe it was March 3rd or 4th. The agreement expired on July 3rd. <clears throat> we made a lot of progress during that 120 days. Uh, there's an item, uh, action item for you later on the agenda to approve an additional 120 days. Uh, I don't believe anyone expected to get a full master development agreement accomplished in the first 120, but the goal of that first 120 days was to see if there, uh, if there's a deal to be had here. We wanted to try and see if there was uh, any bogeys or any major minefields out there that were just going to tank it and there wasn't any purpose on going forward. What we found during the 120 days is there is a lot of uh, interest by both Harcourt and the port um, that Harcourt has been working with, uh, with the city uh, and uh, with the port in a very uh, productive manner. Um, and while we don't have a formal agreement uh, to put forward at this time, we do have a lot of accomplishments. <clears throat> the 120 days was spent uh, getting Harcourt up to speed. Uh, up to speed means uh, educating them on the cleanup activities and the timing of those cleanups. Uh, educating them on the contents of the master plan that uh, both you and the City Council approved back in December, uh, making them aware of what the city responsibilities are regarding roads and infrastructure, uh, getting them educated on the, uh, the Western Crossing and the Western Washington University uh, uh, presence down on the waterfront. And then uh, Harcourt conducted a site visit during that time, I believe that was in early May, where they met all the city team and the, uh, the Western Washington University team, along with obviously the port team and yourselves. Um, we, during that time, during that site visit, we did a lot of negotiating. Uh, we showed them the sites so that they could better understand the grades and the, uh, the challenges of the grades and the different aspects of the site uh, characteristics. We negotiated a framework agreement that framework agreement set the stage for what the port can and cannot legally do. I think that was a very important piece of this for, uh, the, for Harcourt to understand. Obviously, they're from Ireland. The laws of Washington are quite a bit different. So we really wanted them to understand what a port legally can do. A lot of time was spent on that. We defined the site, the 10.8 acres for the initial development site and then options for future. Um, we, we defined what that would look like. We established a method for evaluating the land, and uh, that, that will be the basis of our price negotiations with Harcourt. And then we started some due diligence. We did uh, some homework. We uh, obviously have Heartland on board as our consultant, and between Heartland and the port staff, we did had a lot of questions for them about past activities, past developments uh, that they've done. And they have, so they've answered some of those concerns, and they have other answers that are forthcoming. Just a little side note to that, uh, uh, the due diligence side of it. Obviously, we're still in the midst of that. We're conducting it. Um, Tara Sundin from the city's parents were just recently over in Ireland, and they went to the Titanic Quarter, and they visited the site, and uh, they visited the museum there. And uh, they reported mm -hmm. back that uh, they thought that Harcourt was a first-class developer. They really enjoyed the museum, and they thought the, the residents and the other structures that they visited on the site uh, were all very well done. So that's kind of anecdotal. Uh, but it, are mem it is from members of our community, and Tara's dad actually worked on the GP site, so he, he understands the mm -hmm. GP site fairly well. That's the past 120 days. Uh, in a bit here, I'm going to talk to you about what we'd like to get done during the next 120 days. In front of you is a, a picture of uh, uh, just a drawing from the full build-out. This could be you know, 30 years from now. It could be 50 years from now. It is what was negotiated and uh, put forward in the master plan. And I put it up here just to kind of give you an overall sense of what the site looks like that we're looking at. Then if you look at the, right tr the red triangle there in the upper corner, that's the IDO or the initial development offering uh, that we went out for RFP with, approximately 10.8 acres. It is the uh, parcel that we are talking to Harcourt about in addition to some possible options to go further down the site. Before I click on the next slide, I want to warn you that it's conceptual. It's... Uh, it's just to give you an idea of what could happen here. It's uh, a bigger build-up than I anticipate would happen in the next 20 or even 30 years, but it is, uh, it's the result of some vision on the, on the behalf of Harcourt. The city team has uh, looked at this from a parts perspective, and the port team has looked at this from a practicality perspective. 
Rob, could you point out on that previous one where the the granary building would be? Certainly. Just in, the very upper just in case people aren't aware. I can find the mouse. There it is. Right here, right where the mouse is. Right in that upper right corner there, in the top of the triangle. Good, thanks. So this is uh, kind of an artist's rendering of what the site could look like. Again, it's, uh, it's, I wouldn't expect at the end of the day the site looks like this. It's just an idea. Um, the granary building is the kind of maroon building in the very upper corner again. And then you've got some uh, kind of more purple color pavilions, or they call them market halls, along the uh, GP dock there along the waterway. And you've got uh, some orange buildings some pink buildings. I believe the orange are office and the pink are residential, and the yellow are anticipated to be university. Now again, this is just a conceptual <coughs> drawing. The actual mix of residential, retail, office, and university will change based on further market studies and further research. Um, but this is the drawing that uh, we're starting to work forward from as an idea of what could happen on the site. It's very similar to the master plan. A couple of roads have changed, uh, a couple of buildings have changed, but otherwise we believe it fits within the master plan that was approved by the city council and the port commission. And we're gonna be working forward from here. So for the next 120 days to try and uh, get further along this process, we probably won't be doing a lot of drawings. We won't be doing a lot of conceptual stuff. That was done to make sure we were even on the same page. If you recall, Harcourt's response to the RFP uh, took up quite a bit more real estate than what we're looking at here and, and varied quite a bit from this and probably didn't fit as well within the master plan. So one of the first things we wanted to do with them is make sure that from a design perspective, we were even in the same ballpark. So the next 120 days, we want to make sure the city and Harcourt can agree on the street alignment and the parks plan. It's very important that the street alignment be agreed on so the city can start constructing streets. We'd like to get WWU and Harcourt talking about that phase of the development and figure out if there's a rule there for Harcourt. Uh, Western has a lot of flex flexibility on how they develop the site and uh, we'd like them to sit down with Harcourt and see if the two of them can come up with a relationship. We'd like to explore the feasibility of the granary building. It's Harcourt's intention at this time to retain the granary and the board mill buildings. They intend to make these very distinctive, iconic projects. This both would be done in the initial phase of the development of the site. So the next 120 days, we'll start to come up with uh, better ideas of what exactly that looks like. But for now, Harcourt has expressed an interest or a desire and said it's their intention to retain both the granary and the board mill buildings. During the next 120 days, we also intend to uh, negotiate a development schedule, how fast buildings go up, how many square feet those buildings are. We, of course, will come up with a price for the land or a purchase price that, uh, for, the, for the land they'll be acquiring or leasing. That's always an option as well. And then we're gonna negotiate performance assurances. We don't know what exactly those will look like. They probably won't be letters of credit. They won't be corporate guarantees, but there will be some sort of performance criteria put on to the developer for this. Commissioner Robbins, you had a question? Uh, <coughs> Rob, the, the area you're talking about is just the pie-shaped area that we saw to begin with. That's uh, correct. It's the pie-shaped area. Um, one of the things Harcourt is asking for is, that's 10.8 acres. One of the things they're asking for is an option on an additional 10 acres. So if you double the size of that pie-shaped area or the triangle, um, that's actually about what the size of the master development agreement will look like. Now, one of the things we've told them all along is in order to get to that second 10 acre, they have to perform on the first 10 acres. If they don't perform on the first 10 acres, we won't give them the second 10. And actually, in reality, the way Frank has structured this agreement is they start off with 10.8 acres. If they develop two acres successfully, they're now down to 8.8, .8, but we give them another two, so they stay at 10.8. So they develop two, we give them another two, they're at 10.8. They develop another two after that, they've now developed four, we give them another two after that. So they always have 10.8 acres in their windshield. Always out in front of them is 10.8, and whatever the behind them is whatever they have successfully done. That ends at about 20 acres. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. Any questions about that structure? Okay. Thank you. Um, 
we have a draft MDA. We've sent that off to them. Frank did excellent work, uh, probably around the clock work on a tight deadline. We sent that off to them a couple weeks ago. Uh, last Thursday or Friday, we got comments back on that. That was our first look at their feedback on our agreement. And then this morning, uh, a pretty early hour, we had a conference call with Harcourt, and we started going over what their comments were. So we are going to take a shot at uh, edition number two of that agreement, that draft agreement. We'll send that off to Harcourt, and then they'll redline that back to us. So that just kind of gives you a pretty good idea where we are in the process. There's a lot left to do. I think we can get it done in 120 days. We'd like to get Harcourt out here for another site visit. It's far more productive when we're sitting in the same room negotiating than it is when we're over a conference phone. Yeah. So we're hopeful they can get out here late August or sometime in September. Um, but I think we can bring this to a conclusion and have a signed master developer agreement uh, by the end of October. We'll at least know for sure whether we're going to be going forward with them or not. Yes, Just sir. roughly, what's the acreage for the park in the center there? Somebody. Somebody have that offhand? <clears throat> I would guess a few acres, but I don't know. Three, maybe? Two or three? Two or three, yeah. yeah. Jim, you mean the, the uh, swoopy one down in the lower left there? Or no, the, the commercial, commercial green. green. The straight one across. That's commercial parallel, green. Yeah. yeah. There. Mm -hmm. yeah. The other thing to point out that doesn't show real well on this drawing is this is all parking here mm -hmm. along the waterfront is all park. And that acreage is... About four. About four acres of park there. This concept they're showing, which is definitely a concept, they're showing more parkland than was originally yeah. guaranteed in the master plan. Not much more. Maybe an acre or two more. Well, with this That's with this right. green space they've got there on the left, right. it would be. Yeah. Oh, yeah. you talk the, about the this, log this pond. If you add that log pond area, yeah, yeah. yeah. that's when you start getting yeah. some excess parkland. That's yeah. and that's proposed way out in the future. Yep. After I mean, that's not in the twenty acres. Yep. So. yep. After I'm gone. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, I've got a question about sort of the three-dimensional organization that they're kind of pitching here. Can you offer any info about what they're thinking vertically? For number of stories? Uh, yeah, just so focus in, you know, kind of get an idea of what this would look like. Because in the master plan, they, you know, some areas can go as high as 200, but I don't think that's what they're proposing. Yeah, they don't have 200 feet anywhere in yeah. here. Um, I, I don't know exactly how many feet, but that, the, basically the concept was to have the taller buildings at the back of the site, so kind of back in, uh, back in this area, mm -hmm. and then have the shorter buildings in the front of the site so it doesn't obstruct views. Uh, but I don't think there's anything in the back of that site that exceeds, uh, you know, 10 stories, probably less than that. And then I noticed there's no railroad, so there's going to be, have to be an effort at some point to push that forward, moving the railroad. Yes, yep. uh, and that's an ongoing effort by the port. We have conversations with the railroad. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, this is uh, the, the railroad has disappeared from this drawing, and uh, obviously no development would happen where the railroad is until we mm -hmm. actually get it moved to the bluff, which could be 10 years, could be 20 years, maybe longer. So that brings up kind of an interesting point. If it is, say, let's say it's 15 years before the railroad can move for whatever reason, and they're, the company is successful on their initial, their initial development, and we give them every acre they accomplish to get another acre, how, well, that's going to be a little bit challenging maybe to continue giving acreage when it's on the wrong side of the tracks. Yeah and, yeah, and I would anticipate they build out the first 10 acres faster than the 15 years. Mm -hmm. It does, the railroad does go through that initial development area, but only a corner of it, so mm -hmm. it doesn't really affect that. And, uh, you know, as, as I said, uh, that would in, in order to it affect any further development or to say that you're getting the first ones done in 10 or 15 years, which would be a great problem to have. So I doubt I'll be here in 15 years, but would it be safe to say that this, con it really is a concept, it, a lot of this has to, a lot of what we're deciding today has to be flexible in the future. Because mm -hmm. if the railroad isn't moving, then we've got to figure out, okay, so they want more to develop. Where is that going to be? How is it going to be? Who is it going to be with? All that. Yeah. So okay. this isn't set in stone. It's just a good, this is our, our best and uh, our good and best starting point. And one of the beauties Concept, of the way yeah. Frank sent this up of, you know, having the 10.8 acres in your front mm -hmm. windshield the whole time is that if the corner in this is taken up by the railroad and we need, they need more development area, we've added it in front of them in the next phase. So. Mm -hmm. Um, there's areas they can certainly develop that are not affected by the railroad. Okay. The only decision we're making today is to extend it 120 days. That's correct. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's it. I mean, it's that's it. Yeah. Well, yeah. future commissions might have to get flexible. 
Yeah. Sure. Yeah. It'll <laughs> yeah. And, we, you know, we've told Harcourt the, the goal here is flex, being flexible, being mm -hmm. nimble, you know, being light on our feet so that we can adapt to changes as needed. So, and I'm not even asking, I think the action items later in the agenda for the 120 days, mm -hmm. I was just giving you an update as to where mm -hmm. we are. Good. Sounds Any good. Questions? Okay. No, I, right. I hope they can make money doing it um, or they won't do it. <laughs> um, on the parks along the front, uh, who, who's going to bear the cost of that? Will Harcourt be involved in the parks along the front dock there? No, they've been involved with the city on the design of those parks, but ultimately the city pays the bill and it's their decision since they're the ones paying the bill. So, uh, But the city has been great and the Harcourt's been great on working together with each other uh, and trying to figure out what that park looks like so that both sides are happy. The developer obviously has a vested yeah. interest yeah. in what those parks look like because it's going to affect the value of their properties. Sure, sure. Hey, Rob, uh, I think, Sylvia, you were at that meeting with the Parks Department, rolled out their initial ideas for the waterfront. Could it be possible to get just a few pages so that um, we don't have to go to every meeting, but we can kind of see what's going on, just some pictures or mm -hmm. photocopies or whatever they're, they're presenting? All right, yeah, cool. we could send those out to you. Okay. I know we're not building it, but it's kind of, you know, nice to keep up on it. Sure, sure. Yeah. That's it. Oh, All right, thanks so much, Rob. Thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioners. This is a short update on the Mount Baker uh, Peninsula. Uh, we've been just looking as we go through uh, working on our Squalicum Harbor Master Plan, what are there vacant properties that might have additional potential for development and what might be able to be done with those? Uh, no action is requested today. This is just for update. We may be coming back to you at a future date with uh, projects or development proposals, but it'll be a while. So the development opportunity we have here is the red line surrounds uh, 5.2 acres of vacant land. It's currently located in the county, but inside of the city's urban growth area. Heavy industrial zoning. We have the truck route over here at uh, actually this uh, Squalicum Parkway comes right along this edge of the site. Um, we have about seven feet of water depth right here along the shoreline, but we're adjacent to the federal channel out here, which is about 26 feet or could be 26 feet deep. Uh, we have water and a sewer available from the city if we annex. And uh, there is no shoreline setback for water dependent uses in the county zoning, and there's no uh, shoreline setback for previously invested. Uh, previously developed industrial area, which is most of the site. Hey, Sylvia. So somebody in Dan's office gave me a, I think it came from Dan um, Stahl's office, gave me a, 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 an image that showed the bathymetry down there. And right there where you said it was seven feet, I'm recalling it being like zero. So w could, you, could you guess about why there might seven be? Seven feet low, at, no, seven feet at High mm -hmm. tide, Minimal. there's seven feet of water. We've got that bathymetry on the next slide. I'll show. I'll oh, show okay, you. great. So the development constraints start narrowing our options. We have uh, a shoreline setback. And now did I lose that? Okay, we have a shoreline setback here in red that is from the forage fish area um, in the county, and that just covers this little corner. Uh, we've actually done some work on the shoreline looking at the fish habitat and there is indeed some fish, some evidence that there's fish using this area. So this corner is out. This blue line here is the shoreline jurisdiction that's not a setback. So in the county, we still have the rest of the site that is usable. Um, we've had some recent comments from the public about Schultz Drive and we're aware that Schultz Drive eventually will need reconstruction if there's going to be any kind of heavy truck traffic on there. It has potholes and it's really not built for heavy truck traffic. The shoreline regulations in the county also have a height limit. Within the shoreline jurisdiction here, 25 feet height in the first 100 feet, this is 200 feet back, 
35 feet in the rest, and then we have unlimited height in this little center, which is about a half an acre. The catch-22 that we're facing is that in the city shoreline regulations, there's a 150 feet to 200 foot buffer, which means the entire site is shoreline buffer with just a tiny little bit in the middle that's uh, developable. And in order to get water, you have to annex to the city. So you have to annex if we want any type of use that needs water. If you do annex, there's virtually no land available. Mm. So the, the trick that we have is, is there a use that we could think of out here that either doesn't require city water, or is there some negotiation we can do to get water and follow the county shoreline regulations while it develops an annex later, or is there some other type of a creative negotiation that we can do with a combination of getting water and still being able to use the land, and that's uncertain. But there, there certainly is some opportunity if it stays in the county and there's a, about a half an acre tiny piece in the middle. And even in the county, the city shoreline regulations, if you develop the very middle, you can't have a water dependent use extending through the shoreline buffer. Some of them, the, like in the waterfront district, if you have a, a barge terminal here, the barge terminal, you can actually drive through here and use the water. You can't in this area. Not, not with the way the regulations are now. Hmm. So that is a, a challenge. Um, some potential uses that if we didn't need water or if we're able to negotiate with the city, uh, dry stack storage, uh, upland boat yard, boat building and repair, and we looked at barge terminal, I'll show you next. The dry stack storage in the county within the shoreline jurisdiction would have to be short. So similar to this picture on the left which would be 35 feet or so open stack storage. You start getting the taller ones that require a roof, you're looking more like 60 to 80 and that exceeds the shoreline regulations. And then we have done various times in the past, we've looked at gravel loading, offloading facilities. Again, the water depth is an issue right at the shoreline there. Uh, a little bit more detail on dry stack storage. We've talked about dry stack storage. We have a need and interest in dry stack storage. Generally, they are 60 to 80 feet tall. This is a building down in um, uh, Anacortes area. You want to have at least 150 to 250 boats, and you need water depth of 8 to 10 feet. We've only got about 7 at the, at the shore there. And then you need some in-water uh, maneuvering space and some upland uh, storage, mostly for parking. And that site is probably big enough for that, other than the, when you pull boats out of the water, you generally want to rinse them off and not put a salty boat away, and that requires water. We're back to the catch-22 issue. This is the barge terminal with minimal dredging, and I think this is the one that uh, Commissioner McCauley was referring to. And the water depth at it's minus seven and I am not clear do you do you know Mike or Fred how the what the water depth how do they measure the water depth when it's minus seven it's it's minus seven from mean low, low water so minus at average low tide you would have seven more feet of right. water below zero and I believe this darker line here is the zero so in the the barge terminal study that we did with minimum dredge, in order to get 20 feet of water depth, which is what we needed for a barge, this causeway was two, um, how far was that? You can't, it's written on there, but you can't read it. So 325 feet long, this particular version with minimal dredge in order to get, you had to have a pier to get out to the deep water out in the channel. And that one, that cost was 7.5 million. The minimal or the additional dredge, this was a shorter causeway, about 220 feet, but the, it required more dredge in order to get the causeway shorter, and that was 18 million. So both of those, as you recall, we brought forward to you last year and concluded that that was probably more money than we could afford to pay at this time, and we didn't pursue that project any further. 
Uh, we are pursuing shoreline restoration projects. We just completed the, the one on the south side of the pro uh, peninsula and we are working to fund the one on the north side of the peninsula. I've got another picture of that. Uh, we did this in 2013 on the south side of the project and that was the, the shoreline around towards Mount Baker, I mean towards uh, Bellingham Cold Storage. It gave some additional space there and reshore, restored that shoreline. And on the north, that's coming up soon uh, in 2015, taking some of the, the bulkhead uh, junk off the shoreline and restoring it with the soft beach like you can see in the conceptual rendering. And again, neither one of those will really affect the shoreline setbacks or buffers. It still allows public access along there and they're really along this one isn't with the 150 foot buffer, there's not much use of that area other than uh, parking and public access. So the next steps, if you have any input or additional ideas on how we might use that uh, area, um, we'd like to hear your input today or another time. Uh, we've got no hurry on this one. Uh, we need to uh, eventually discuss or consider annexation, whether that makes sense to pursue annexation in order to get water and what would that do with the shoreline regulations and the buffers. We need to think about and possibly budget Schultz Drive upgrade. Um, we do, our, uh, Fred is talking about pothole repairs this year, but in order to rebuild that road, We've gotten some rough order of magnitude cost estimates, a million dollars if you just want vehicle traffic on it, up to two million if you want truck traffic on it. We are doing a dry stack storage feasibility study. Dan Stahl's working on that right now to get input from boaters, how many would be interested in dry stack storage. If there's an interest, then we'll pursue it next year with a more formal study. This is one site we might look at with the shoreline height limits. This may not be the best site. We might look at for some other sites. Yes? You obviously have to be very aware of the boundaries of those um, marinas or whatever you want to call it for passage of fish in the spring. And what, mm -hmm. what do you have planned on, in taking care of that shoreline coming right down to the water? Well, that was, that was a good part of these two shoreline restorations we did. That conceptual rendering there, that area that we would be restoring is where the forage fish, uh, sand, lance, and surf smelt eggs, possibly even herring, but I think it's mostly sand, lance, and surf smelt along that little pocket beach. And that's where we're talking about enhancing it with better okay. cobbles for the fish rather than the riprap that we have now. And then we've already done a lot of the work on the, the other shoreline. They really get picked on by the blue herons. If you've been mm -hmm. out yeah. to Semiamo recently and drive around mm -hmm. Drayton Arbor, there's at least 100 great blue herons there hmm. sitting on the rocks yeah. waiting. <laughs> well, the nice thing about this cobble beach is it does give them a little more, the, the, the juveniles a little more covered in the, in the gravel there too, yeah. a little more habitat. Good. So the last uh, two parts of the next step is that we're going to then look at the shoreline enhancement of the one I just showed you next year, and then we're going to finish <coughs> the Squalicum Comprehensive Scheme of Harbor Improvements either, either later this year or early next year. But again, one of the issues that we're looking at with the Squalicum Comprehensive Scheme is are there vacant pieces of land that could be better utilized, and if so, what would we use them for? And that's what we're looking at today. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Uh, hang on one sec, Sylvia. Okay. So I'd like to add something to the potential uses. It seems that the, the barge terminal, as cool as it would be, is just probably not a smart mm -hmm. thing to, to pursue. The short stack vessel storage, I think that's probably smart to at least store that in there. But I'd also like to add in um, something that I think it gets missed a lot here locally, and I know some people are working on it, and that's a recreation economy and what this land could possibly do to serve that I guess part of our economy, which is different than tourism, but I think this might have some potential as well. So recreation, as in vessels, or recreation? Or uh, I don't have a specific answer to that, but um, I think if we had a conversation with Lonnie over at the Tourism Bureau, I think she could give us a good a good head start on which direction to go, and understanding what the recreation economy is. 
I know it's I know it's a, a growing thing here in, in Washington, especially in Puget Sound. Uh, can you tell me the date on the the image that shows the bathymetry with the green lines when, from Cascade, that Cascade uh, engineering? It was last year, and if you would like, I, it was uh, last. You know, I, I don't, I can't see it, it's too small, but yeah. I can get a copy of that to you and send it out to you. Okay. Along with, what else did we just say? We, the recreation, the, uh, recreation. the, the city park yeah. uh, things. Uh, all right, I just want to, because I, I, if I can find it, I think I still have that other image. I, it's I a different image. I can just send one. you a text message telling you what the date is, because I've got sure. the date that we did the update from the, that we did a commission update uh, that Dan Stahl did, and I, I, I know when that was. I think it was, might have been April of 2013, but I will yeah. send you the date. Awesome, thank you. And then one final question. This might be more for Shirley. Who's, I think she's, she stopped out. Dang, I just missed her. I should have asked her first. There's a parking lot behind the Gaston Bay building and adjacent to the, mm -hmm. to the plywood plants. Can anybody tell me how that parking is allocated? Because it's not, it's not gated off. Most of it is Bellingham or uh, Mount Baker plywood. Okay. Gaston was interested in leasing a greater amount of that, and Bellingham plywood at that point said they need it for their employees, and they weren't it wasn't available for additional leasing. And that's why Gaston had to carve those few spaces mm -hmm. out along the bluff because there really wasn't any more space available. So, so it, it Mount is. Mount Baker Plywood does. They're take actually most leasing of that it, part. paying for the access. Yeah, it's part access. of their lease. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> All right. Let's move on to our first action item, and it'll be number one in real estate. Steve. Commission motion to approve a modification of airport hotel lease agreement between the Port of Bellingham and Bellingham High LLC. Anyway, um, the first thing I, uh, staff would like to, to uh, say is we uh, uh, thank the commission for adjusting the agenda uh, this afternoon. Unfortunately, uh, for them, so couldn't be here in attendance to, uh, to address the commission. But um, anyway, we thank you nevertheless. Um, a brief background uh, on past commission action on this, uh, this agreement. Uh, in June 2013, the commission approved of, uh, of an airport post uh, lease uh, with Bellingham High or Bellingham Holiday Inn to develop and construct to operate a full service uh, uh, hotel, conference center center and restaurant facility, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and then in December of 2013, uh, the developer came back and asked for modification to increase the site to uh, accommodate a larger program, which incre increased the, the meeting and banquet space for the site. Uh, and then recently in May of 2014, the lease was modified to include the uh, utility service agreement between the city and the port to provide water sewer services to, to the site. This modification addresses uh, the, the developer's request to, to, uh, to move forward the beginning of the construction period from May 15th of this year to August 30th, 30th of this year, and then to uh, move back the substantial completion or the com completion of, of the uh, the uh, facility to from November 15th of 2015 to, uh, to um, December 31st, 2015. Uh, there's been some delays with the permitting process and that's what really what's driving this request um, by the developer. Um, out of the gate, uh, the developer even admits that they were, uh, their submittals on their architectural uh, package uh, to the county were less than what they would consider their, their standard. Uh, that slowed things down. They, they have resolved that. Currently, the discussion is uh, about stormwater and how to manage stormwater on the site. And uh, they are still in negotiations with the county on how best to resolve that issue. Uh, the, uh, the developer is meeting with the, the county uh, officials this week to hopefully further that along. Any questions? No. <laughs> Nothing there either? No, I really don't have any questions other than uh, 
it's just going to delay it a little bit. Um, do you think you'll ask for another delay? That's always a that's a good question. It's a difficult question for staff to answer. I, I think the contractor and or the developer, uh, Commissioner Robbins, is uh, is highly motivated to get this project out of, you know out of the ground. Um, I, my opinion is that uh, they would much rather be up and operating than push the rental commencement day back. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, that's it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, sir. Thank you. And item number two. A motion authorizing the executive director to extend the exclusive negotiating agreement, or ENA, with Harcourt LLC for the Waterfront District to October 31st, 2014. It's what I was referring to earlier when I did my update to you on the Harcourt negotiations. We're just asking your permission for another 120 days. Real simple amendment to the agreement with Harcourt. Do no. you have any questions about this? No. Uh, so we're looking at November then, ish. Uh, that's, that's four months from now. Yeah, yeah. yeah early like November, that. late October, something okay. like that. Yeah, because right. I think it would go from July third, or would it go from when we sign it? I can't remember what it says. Yeah, we'll but have to look at that. November -ish. Yeah, yeah. So it, we heard some people speak to the the issue of the grand rebuilding today, and that's mm -hmm. something that that I think that we really need to get moving on sooner than later. And if we're looking at November now, um, I'm thinking we need to do something about the building. And um, does, does Harcourt at this time have anything that we can put a, like a date on that say, yeah, this is, this is when we'd like to start with this? We'll start pushing them for more specific and concrete dates. Um, in the short term or the near term, I've asked Fred's crew to board up the broken windows uh, okay. to try and help with some of the bird and the water problems on it. Um, we're, gonna, we're not sure we can get to the tower, but we're going to do all the rest of the windows. We're going to board them up. I've asked Marie to start looking at some uh, community-type activities that could go down there, maybe some artists paint a mural on the side of it or something. It's kind of fun to, to show the community there's an interest in keeping the building, and it's going to be around. So there's more to come on that. Marie and I are developing some things, and in the meantime, Fred will be doing some, some very light uh, maintenance-type stuff to the okay. building. So folks have gotten, or a lot of people should have gotten something in the mail from Ecology. It looks like cleanup, Mike, we're kind of wrapping up about 2017 yeah. in that first, that's an, the, the initial 10 acres, right? Bulletin just came, yeah. So uh, and that's kind of speaking to my question about how soon can we get that part rolling, because some of it's going to be delayed for a couple of years just because we're waiting for cleanup activity, which means they won't be doing anything for a couple of years. But that also kind of begs the question, where will the city be on um, road construction, that sort of thing? Any, do we have any kind of info about that at this point? Yeah, Commissioner, uh, I think we're lining up pretty well. We, we have, uh, you're right, we do have the work moving forward with ecology, and, and we're trying to push that with ecology as fast as we can mm -hmm. go. Um, that is our top priority. That's why we carved that area out for its own consent decree. And at the same time, um, we have always identified that portion of the waterfront as the first phase of development to make that first important gateway connection to the existing um, uh, downtown Bellingham. So the city has been working hard on that particular access point, mm -hmm. Granary Avenue, basically, as well as their um, the, the park designs that you asked for recently. So I think the combination of the port's priority work on cleanup, the city's priority work on, on streets and parks, and then Harcourt starting in that first 10.8 acres all lines up to hopefully start, a, um, start showing um, a building there mm -hmm. starting to show up in the next three year to five years. Okay, all right. So I, I think there's a there's a pretty good um, consensus among a lot of people in the community about getting the Granary building going. And I think some, at least two uh, developers are interested in, you know, they're kind of champing at the bit on that one. So I'd like to see how, how soon, I know you can have an answer for that today, but I'd like to see how soon we can get an answer and get, get a pretty good idea about when they're thinking about it. Well, and I also want to caution folks that uh, it will ultimately be Harcourt's decision on whether Harcourt or uh, some other group does the, the renovation of the building. Sure. We, we made a recommendation to Harcourt with a local group that we thought had a good mm -hmm. proposal, and Harcourt has done a lot, had a few meetings with that group, and they enjoy working with that group, but ultimately they get to decide because it's the entrance to their development, so we're going to leave that decision to them. I guess ultimately you guys get to yeah. decide, but um, we've told Harcourt to, to ultimately make that recommendation and not have it be done from staff. Sure. And I guess along those same lines, uh, when Kat gave her 
Katzi gave her um, um, public comment, um, it sounded like they had an agreement, and they have they there. There is no agreement other than we'd like to work with you, and I think it's important to make sure that's clear. There's been no nothing signed between uh, uh, Tallhouse and and, uh, and Harcourt at this point. Um, now, the the positive part is they are talking and they are both kind of aligned and going in the same direction. But there's a big difference. They can get down the road, and any number of things could make uh, Harcourt change their mind. Uh, until that contract is signed with one of them, it, it's not. And I don't think for the developer we can, at this time, force them to do that. That's going to come in the next 120 days in, in the agreement. So, just wanted to clarify that. You know, I'm just I'm just happy that Harcourt's interested in, in working on preserving the building. I think that um, I had I had heard about a lot of structures on the waterfront. We could we could tear it down and build something that looks just like it and do it for less money. But if you said that to an art aficionado, they would probably pull your hair out because I don't know any original art that's worth less than uh, than, a, than a copy. So copies are always worth less than the original. So yeah, the building probably could be reconstructed for less money, but for some reason we place extreme value on originals, and it definitely is an original, even if it's not the most architecturally interesting building in our city. I think everybody has admitted to that. But I'm, I'm for one, uh, I don't care who rebuilds it, uh, I just hope that it gets done and sooner than later. So I'm glad that they're they're interested in whether they're working with Holt House, they're doing it on their own, doesn't really matter to me. Just doing it, I think, is the, is the key. So I'm really excited about that part. But So as soon as we can get an answer from them about that without, you know, you know tweaking anybody's. All right. So uh, anything further? Well, I, <clears throat> it's good to, looking at this bulletin that some of you may be received in the mail, and we certainly have a copy of up here that... Uh, I guess it would be expected, but all of the cleanup has been done with ecology oversight so that we have a good solid background to that. And, and it's nice to know that that's taken care of. That's it? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Get back to work, Rob. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, final item, marine terminals. Commission motion authorizing the executive director to oh. sign an interlocal funding agreement between the City of Bellingham and the Port of Bellingham for the port expenditure of 125000 toward the purchase of a Bellingham Marine Response and Firefighting Vessel and increase the outside services portion of the port's 2014 operating budget by an equal amount. Good afternoon, Commissioners. You recall that about uh, three months ago or so I came before you and, and we had a memorandum of understanding between the port and the city of Bellingham regarding the use of the fireboat and how that would work. And uh, that was a grant requirement. Um, one of the other grant requirements was that we also have a matching fund. The total fund uh, allocated by the Department of Homeland Security was $1 million. And they're asking for a 25% increase or a matching in, uh, a local match. And uh, of that, this agreement, if, if approved, would allocate uh, half of that from the Port of Bellingham with the other half already been approved by the uh, City of Bellingham. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Not really, read it. I guess good. my, the only question I would have, um, other than a fire boat, how's this boat gonna be used? Well, according to the Memorandum of Understanding, what we would do would be when they go out training, for instance, they would be also looking at uh, what are called MITSA uh, regulated facilities. That's the Maritime uh, Transportation Security Act. And so there are certain facilities around Bellingham Bay that they would be able to take a shoreside look at it, uh, or, or say, uh, rather a waterside look, and know whether or not there was any unusual activity there. That I wouldn't expect would uh, result in a lot of, uh, of increased activity in, of any kind. But if we should uh, find ourselves going to a higher uh, marine safety level, uh, a higher security level, then at that point it would be the port's discretion as to whether or not we ask for the port or the fireboat to also provide us with a security platform specifically for the Alaska Ferry as it comes in. What about towing? They would 
Not that I know of. I didn't think so. Yeah. No. It's pretty specific, though. So marine response uh, would be just what you said, not something that the Coast Guard would do or anything like no, that? No, the, the, the vessel will be outfitted with certain detection equipment uh, that is mandated by Homeland Security. But uh, by and large, this is a fireboat, and it was designed to be a fireboat but it also act as a security platform and provide us with that layered security that we need for, for the port. So, uh, Tamara, Tamara, did we budget for this last year? I don't think we did. Right, okay. So, uh, what sort of long-term commitment are we, is expected, I should say? To the best of my knowledge, the only long-term commitment is more okay. That's correct. So just this is, just this, this is a one-time deal. Okay. Uh, the long-term commitment is we provide the mortgage. They okay. do all the maintenance on the boat. They staff the boat. They run the boat. We just provide them a place to park the boat. Now, a question to Chris. This is going to be in your harbor, and there were a lot of complaints about where the, where the old boat was stored. Um, apparently, it had been run into a lot by fishing boats as it was just kind of a weird corner. What are you thinking about for that? We um, sat down with um, Chief Henkel at uh, the fire department and have addressed that issue and we um, tried to come up with four or five different options in sites within the harbor um, but it was from the opinion of the first responders who will be operating the boat that it stay where it is because mm -hmm. when you do look at it from an aerial shot mm -hmm. it's straight out so mm -hmm. they jump in the boat and they're on the way so it'll um, it will stay where it is okay it's just yeah. gonna be a sore spot <laughs> it is okay all right um, it makes sense yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's it for my questions. So, oh, oh, before we go on this one, no, I do want to lodge a little bit of a complaint. This boat should have been built locally. I know it's not your issue. I'm just saying it for the world to hear. This boat could have been built locally, and it was not. I think it's a California company that's going to build this boat, and that's a bit of a shame because we have plenty of boat builders here that could have done this. But I don't know what the procurement guidelines were on that one, but it would have been nice if we could have had that done here. But uh, so anything very you? true. Was that decision to go to the California firm? Uh, I was at the MAC meeting when that was discussed a bit. It didn't go out for bid. It was more what the fire department thought would be the best boat for their needs. Is right. That the only correct? other aspect that I know is that this is under a general administration yeah. services contract. Yeah. So they probably had a list of, like we do, right? We have a list of yeah. what, are, what are those, how do you, what do you call that, that term for the company? preferred something whatever that is qualified well, yeah whatever they are yeah, yeah. preferred yeah. yeah but i still wish we could have had this done here walking camp anyway. uh so if nothing further let's take a vote all right all right all in favor aye aye, aye. okay Thank Thank that you. Neil. a new business yes sir okay. we have a, a late addition to the menu today this came in on friday it is a multi-party boathouse agreement uh, you'll recall you executed one of these for Blaine. Uh, this is the first one for Squalicum Harbor. We're so excited we wanted to get it in front of you today. So <laughs> Super. Uh, we're going to have Diane pass these out. <laughs> Wonderful. Commissioner, mm. uh, Dan Stahl had a, a death in his family, so he's uh, off. I'm going to pinch hit for him since he and I worked on this with uh, the Harbor Masters. Uh, so this is the first uh, multi-party boathouse agreement for a multi-party boathouse in Squalicum Harbor, and it is, uh, Chris, help me out, it's... Uh, it's the Bellingham Bay 4. 4, so it's, but it's EE. That's uh, correct. It's it's EE. Uh, it's a little clod out on the end. Yeah. Right, and uh, uh, recall that we had, uh, uh, you had adopted some rules and regulations which required these uh, uh, entities to do a couple of things um, as a condition of, uh, of staying. One is they form an organization. We didn't care what kind it was, as long as a legal organization, which provided an insurable interest so they could buy insurance. They, they maintain registration. There's a current address for notice so that we can get a hold of the boathouse organization. They execute a boathouse agreement with the port, which has indemnifications to the port. Uh, their mortgage agreements are in good standing and they provide uh, insurance to the port. So, Bellingham Bay 4 LLC uh, uh, has completed this and so what we'd like is your authorization to have the executive director execute the uh, multi-party boathouse agreement. Uh, this is the first of the ones in Squalicum Harbor. 
Any questions? Shall I read the motion? Yes, go ahead. A motion authorizing the executive director to sign the boathouse agreement with Bellingham Bay 4 LLC. You ought to read it. Hey, Frank, sure. um, having not seen this before, is there any substantial difference between this one and the one we signed? No, it's a we standard signed? agreement we presented. It okay. said the checklist I read is what they have to accomplish and they have okay. to sign the agreement as written. Okay, great. Frank, did they ask for um, a long term leases? No, they did not. Because um, that was a contention in the other one. And if these folks don't need that long-term lease, that's, that's good. I mean, it, it shows that they, they trust that we're not going to yeah, pull a rug out from under yeah. them. And, and it's great that, that these four have signed. Um, it is. Uh, and it, what it does is create an insurable interest in it. it uh, you know, the, the ancillary benefits, once you get insurance, you're going to mm -hmm. start looking after your structure, mm -hmm. you're going to be careful. So it has a lot of benefits by triggering the marketplace to provide insurance to us. You know, it's funny. It, it was a, there was a weird spot in there where these boathouses were worth nothing because uh, because of the fire creating, a, I, I think, honestly, a marketplace that didn't exist because there was no surety that your neighbor wasn't going to burn your structure down. And as difficult as this has been for the people that have had to go through it, in the long run, I'm, I feel pretty confident this is the right way to go and it's going to give them the value back that they otherwise might have lost. So I'm pretty excited about this, even though I know it's difficult for them to go through. But I think they did a good job, and so we're ready yeah. to go on the first one. Yeah. No? no? All good? Yeah. All right. Keep them coming. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Awesome. Yeah. So That's uh, wonderful. Way to go. go. That's, uh, well, it's really the port staff. I'm just filling in for Dan. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm saying to Chris, way to go. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. I, I wanted to point out the uh, the hard work that, that some of the groups are going through right now. And I, I think um, now that this one's paved the way, I think we'll see more of them follow suit. And, and there's now a, a precedent. And, and that's Super. exciting. Yeah. Yep, thank Super. you. Uh, so any new business? Anybody? Gentlemen? No. All right. Uh, I've got one quick thing. I heard noise study funding. Did Dan Zank leave? Maybe Tamara. What what is that? We're funding a noise study next year. Oh, it's in the budget for it's in the budget for 2014, but it's going to be postponed until next year. That's Did what you I say that? I'm okay. sorry. It's in the 2014 budget, but it looks like it's going to be postponed until next year. Do you know why the postponing? I don't know. Okay. All right. I'll ask Dan later. Um, anybody else? Anything from staff? Nothing. All right. With that, thank you all for coming on this glorious day. Anybody want to go swimming? Because I'm hot. No. There's one.